Hi guys, this is the first episode of Card Crunchers podcast with me, Pokemon King. And Pokey Mike, sometimes Pokey Mike 102. So this is a podcast, the first episode of which we're going to be talking about a multitude of TCGs. We're talking about the market, news, and all things trading card games. So we're going to start off with the Pokemon European Championships in London, which I was in attendance this past weekend. So the European Championships is less than a year from Worlds, which was also in London, both at the XL uh, in London, which is great. So it's quite a big thing for the UK to be having two events in such a short period of time. I don't know if that was planned or that was just because Worlds was pushed back due to COVID and stuff. But having two events in such a close period of time, which is fantastic, it, it's a lot easier for people to travel over um, from a lot of Europe as well. The Americans will travel anyway, um, but it was it was a fantastic event um, and there was lots to do, a load of vendors as well. So this was the first one that actually had vendors. Um, so Brotherhood Games was there, Magic Madhouse, um, those kind of things, which was fantastic. You couldn't come, unfortunately, Pokemon. No, um, no. Um, and I didn't make worlds either <laughs> so I did, but but both, both of the times you know it was in london and close i missed out unfortunately but um yeah i mean curious question here what you went to both so did you did you prefer world to the europeans uh, so i think they were they were actually quite different the layout of the the whole thing was actually a lot different where the pokemon center was to sign up and stuff like that there was actually another event going on at the XL whilst regionals was happening. So it, to me, it felt like they didn't think it was going to be as big. Um, there was like a franchise trade show, which was quite interesting because people were just walking from the trade show and kind of sort of asking questions. I had a lot of people asking me, oh, are these prices in pounds? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, I can't believe some of these cards are worth money. Um, the classic. Which is obviously, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's something we don't really think about because we're so yeah. involved in the hobby. Yeah. Um, it's only when you talk to people outside of the hobby you realise that we sound like we're talking a load of rubbish yeah. sometimes. <laughs> Making up. Um, yeah, but that, that, you know, that was great. I'd say I think I preferred this one to Worlds. There was more players, but it meant that when that was taking place, a lot of people kind of left the main area to go in and start playing. So oh, okay. it was, it was busier but quieter at times than yeah. Worlds was. Um, I think there was a lot less hype than there was for um, Worlds, which was great. So I, I met up with a lot of people, which was nice. Every a lot of people there, like the content creators and such, which was great to see. Um, I did some selling, which was great. I made a little bit of profit profit after the weekend of the hotels and stuff, um, which goes towards the PSA submissions, which I have coming back. And it, yeah, I mean, it's a free, free trip, technically, then. Like, it's all paid yeah. for, so you, you sold a few items, it works out pretty well, then. Yeah, exactly. And I think they ended up actually closing the trade area because it was a fire hazard, so they shut it all down. Um, th- they came over, which was quite funny. Um, I feel like, they shut it down. I feel like it happens at every Pokemon event, like, I don't understand how they don't realise how popular it's going to be. Like, every single event, they underestimate the amount of people that are going to come. Like, how do they do that? I don't know. It's just, it seems so weird that they just, yeah, I don't know, strange. Yeah, it is, it does seem like they should be able to gauge just how big Pokemon is now. Um, it, It was busy enough to see, I think... The first, so I went on the Friday and Saturday. On the Friday, there wasn't really a trade area until the evening. It's not necessarily a self designated it's not a designated trade area. It's just a load of tables in a sort of kind of booth sort of thing that people just take over and start selling on. Um, so that's how it happened at Worlds, and this is how it happened at uh, the European Championships as well. So Friday, I wasn't selling anything. Saturday, I spent most of the morning and some of the afternoon just sat there selling. Yeah. Um, I was just blaze packs and fresh carp and sleepy snorlax so we all had it in a line basically do we um, share so a, a table together we had a table each they're only small sort of square tables like you need at um but they had 
like pokeball designs on them which was quite cool so I, they must get them out especially for that but they we had it all essentially in a line so people coming over it's it's quite hard to describe because it's it's people can come over and walk past and have a look in and see what's happening it's yeah it's only when i left that i looked in and i realized how many people were around this raid area which was um yeah it was fantastic but it's a, it's a great event great to meet people i don't know when the next one in the uk will be probably not for a while because we've been so lucky to have two in one but i imagine there'll be some in europe coming up soon because obviously the European Championships will be every year. Yeah. So I know there's some other events this year, so maybe that'd be something that we can all go to and meet up again. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll finally make it to a Pokemon specific event. That'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. It's the best part of it really is meeting the people in the yeah. community that we've been talking to for so long. Yeah. And there was I was quite surprised because I actually took some rice with me and there was quite a few people asking about it they were looking at the slabs they were asking me if i had any of the disney stuff which was which kind of rolls into the next subject that we're going to be talking about which yeah. is the disney 100 set so i'll let you take over because you have a lot more knowledge on this than i do yeah sure so yeah it's been it's, it's, it's been very strange obviously as you know the the supply and sort of allocation was cut just before it came out um, but even then, sort of box prices were around a hundred pound. I, I I feel like they've they've risen a little bit. I mean, it's it's a week. It's bit yes, yeah, it's a week since release the official release date now. Um, and yes, yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's it's a very interesting one to follow because obviously it does. It's very very mainstream. It's Disney, so it, it yeah. does pique a lot of people's interest into why Schwartz. So um, yeah, I'm actually curious though. Did you? what sort of questions were they just asking if you had any disney 100 or yeah if they were just asking if i had any um sealed or like yeah just in general like, i wouldn't have graded but singles as well um, yeah and i don't sort of take them to white slabs with me so yeah i didn't and i I've, I've got a box coming that i need to pick up from the post office so are you I'll gonna open that, I mean. open that? yeah i'll open that i'll probably open it for the channel i'm, I'm yeah. excited the, looking at your openings um I saw you pulled the. You, I saw you pulled an SP actually. Finally. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Nine boxes, half a case. Half. half a case. Yeah. So, what are you? What have you done? Is that all the boxes you got, like singly? That's all the boxes that I have with me at the moment. I, as yeah. you know, I, I might talk about this actually, but um, so that that. There, as some people might know, there was an early release in Japan a week, a week before on the on the weekend. If you went into the Disney store in Japan, you could pick up the Disney 100 boxes. Um, I noticed that and started picking, trying to pick up boxes on Bai, which is the Japanese forwarding site. And um, what actually happens when you purchase something on Bai is they they will show it as sold on Bai. But they, you then have to wait for them to go purchase it on Macari or Amazon Japan, whatever one you're using. And I ordered three different sets of boxes. So I think I ordered three boxes, three boxes, and four boxes. And only one of them, I got an email through like two hours later saying it was confirmed. And then a few hours later, the other two said they were cancelled. So I was like, oh my god, like there's all these people on there trying to buy up these boxes i'm really struggling to get some and i thought because it said sold after you purchased it i thought someone else has bought that so i then just yeah. started putting in loads <laughs> loads oh. of orders and, and it kept coming up sold and i'm like oh this is going to be cancelled i keep missing it by like a couple of minutes it's now shown so so i've I, yeah i've had i've had nine boxes come so far i i opened them all to finally get one sp um but yeah i've got I've got quite a lot of other boxes that I need to import. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I've got a case and um, a few other loose boxes, which I will, you know, they're going to be expensive. I still have to pay yeah. import tax on them. I think roughly it works out £95 a box. And to be honest, I haven't quite looked at prices at the moment, but I think possibly they're a, lit a tiny bit more than that. Yeah. Um, but obviously you have the risk of, now it's officially out buying loose boxes 
and they could be dead boxes because someone could have got yeah. the case. Um, so they, you know, I, to be honest, I don't really know what I'm going to do with them when they arrive. I'm sure I can uh, contemplate over that one. But yeah, I kind of, I kind of FOMO'd on the set against myself <laughs> on on Bai. You played yourself a little bit. I'm like, all these all these people are trying to trying to buy it. Yeah. I, need, I need to buy it, and yeah. it, was, it was just yeah. yeah, it was just me. It was just me uh, against myself. But I mean. Lesson learned, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that was uh, unfortunate. It happens. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think with that, that and I, I, I see you said about you reckon people are going to be wearing the packs as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's a big thing. Yeah, I, I, I'd never thought about it to be honest, but you can do it with any white straw sets because of the new format where. It's, it's it's always got a rare as a minimum in there and then the next card is separate so yeah. it's just that people don't do it because the boxes are normally like 50 pounds or you know yeah. they're not they're not expensive so the only time you, i think people buy loose white schwarz packs is if you just walk into a shop right and and yeah. oh you know i want to open a few there's some there People don't generally buy them loose online, so it's not something that's really spoken about. But obviously, in the case of Disney 100, where the prices for the boxes are so high, I think potentially a lot of people could seek to just open a few packs. Like because it's so mainstream, you know, some someone might just want to buy a few packs for their kids and be like, yeah. "Oh, you know, we we both love and watch Disney. You know, let's just, you know, grab yeah. a couple of packs to open." Like even the even the uncommons, like all the cards look really nice. So, um, they're so pretty, yeah. Yeah. So it was definitely, yeah, it's de definitely something I wanted to cover to make, try and make people aware, like, ju you know, just be careful and don't overspend on loose packs because potentially there's, you know, not a lot in them. And if they're happy with just getting, you know, rare foils, then obviously that's absolutely fine as well. But it's, it's being aware of it that's the main thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, think that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's quite, quite important. important. I've, I've seen, seen, so I was talking to Greg Growlis at uh, the region, at uh, the European Championships, and he said, because he does whatnot streams, yeah. I believe they had sold some Disney packs for like £9 each on whatnot. Um, so obviously, we, we've spoken about whatnot before. People generally will pay above market price for their packs to be opened there, but it's a, uh, that, that wouldn't be what, the medium would be for the market price of packs and boxes, for instance. Um, nobody really is using the whatnot data, which is absolutely fair enough, as they shouldn't. Um, but I know Japan 2 UK is now selling single packs as well of the Disney 100. Um, I think they were selling boxes for around 120 and packs for around £7 each. Yeah, I mean, when it was pre-order, you could get... I don't know if they've changed it now, but I I did get a box for a hundred, yeah, you know, on there, when when the allocation cut happened, and I thought I wasn't getting anything. Um, but yeah, I think I think with stores, you know, you're you're fine, really. I mean, technically, the same thing could happen with with cases. It's just, it, it, it's pretty much the same thing, you know, dead boxes and cases, dead packs and boxes. Yeah. Um, if you're buying from a store and you know you trust them, then that that's the yeah. best you can do. Um, and also buying at the start of the release is is also another way to safeguard. They've just opened a case; it's just come out. They've got the case. They picked up the box, put it straight, and it's shipped out. Like there's no time there oh, for, yeah. for any. You know, and, and, and something else people forget is that you could just keep buying from the same store, knowing it's coming from a case. Maybe not in Disney yeah. 100 because there probably would have been a lot of orders, but a lot of other Weiss Schwarz sets that don't yeah. go out on release day, um, you could just to keep keep purchasing them until you hit you know an SP and then you stop and you've kind of gone through a case without owning a case and yeah, yeah. It's, it's a it's it's a weird dynamic with mapping. It's you know it's something that for me was really new and hard to try to get your head around and, and work out the best way to do things. But yeah, yeah the other thing is... Why is it kind of own thing, really, yeah. isn't it, compared yeah. to a lot of TCGs? There's so many more. And that's why the content that you make is so important, because it does highlight for a lot of people. And 
obviously the Disney videos for yours that have done really well so far is generally because people are very interested, which is, you know, people, we all make obviously, you know, content on different card games and stuff, but the content about making people aware of these things is so important to be had. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't just want to do openings or like, when I'm yeah. doing my openings, I want to give information that helps people because White Wars has so many, it's, it's very niche and with the mapping and, and pull rates and things like that, it's coming into that. If you've only ever come from Pokemon or just a TCG that doesn't have any of that, it's like, you don't even know what questions to ask. Like when I, when I started collecting White Wars from Pokemon, uh, I was buying, you know, some random loose Attack on Titan booster boxes that some stores in the UK that still had them, you know, thinking, oh, maybe like 10 years from now, you know, they, they hold really good value. You know, six months from then I realized, oh, like no one's really going to trust that this box isn't a, a dead box. I had no idea yeah. what they were. Um, so yeah, it's just trying to just make people aware of those things from the get go. Cause with Disney 100, it's a set that, you know, I'd imagine quite a lot of people that buy the set probably haven't opened White Shores before, so they just have no idea about that. So, I really, yeah, really important, I think, to, to try and share as much of that information as possible. And, yeah, talk, I guess talking of other TCGs, I hear Fab is doing quite well at the moment. Yeah, yeah Fab is popping, I think. Um, there's definitely, I've been collecting since November, December 2020. Yeah. That was when I got into Flesh and Blood, and it fairly quickly took over as one of my, I mean, my main TCG aside from Pokemon. Um, I've, I've collected all sorts of TCGs over the years, but Flesh and Blood was one that really kind of sort of resonated with me. I think the, the story, Legend Story Studios, James White, everything to do with it kind of pulled me in. So the markets are doing really well. Um, we've obviously discussed it. We talk about it almost on the daily now. Yeah about flesh and blood because it is a very even though it made me realize that the actual european championships they go back to that how little people know about flesh and blood like a lot of people would see me sharing on my story all the time and making posts about it but they didn't really know too much about it so it's now it's starting to pick up steam the player base is growing massively across the world they've got a japan roadmap for the next 12 months we're going to be getting Japanese language cards. We've recently got uh, foreign languages with Italian, Spanish, German, and French. So we're at five languages now being printed simultaneously. So far, we've not had too many issues, uh, which is great. It's still an indie TCG, so it's not owned by a large corporation like most of the other TCGs are. So they still make mistakes, of, of course, of every card game, but yeah, yeah it's, it's doing really, really well, well and well, something, something that's, that's kind of similar with Weiss as well that isn't actually really talked about flesh and blood is the pull rates especially for the first couple of sets so the first two sets it's one legendary per case and how much is in a case is it four so there's four boxes per case 96 packs so it's one legendary per case but it's also one foil majestic per case which actually really very rarely ever gets talked about so they're just as rare as legendaries and some of the four majestics now like east strike for instance is you know 200 300 pound now which is more expensive than all of the legendaries in the first set bar the fiendel spring tunic so yeah flesh and blood is really starting to grow we've got our 10th set coming out in the summer from dusk till dawn so that's interesting to see that's kind of like a return to monarch but I think the main takeaway with Flesh and Blood really is we've got a good balance of collectors and players now, whereas it was at the start all collectors and investors, and then, then it became just a player's card game, and then now it's kind of a good medium of both. Yeah, it's gone through lots of sort of different kind of like transitions, I guess, hasn't it? Um, I, yeah. I, I guess a question I've always wanted to ask you, but never actually have, like obviously for me looking from the outside i don't collect uh, flesh and blood but the art style is similar to magic isn't it am i right yeah. in saying that so yeah. what 
what drew you to flesh and blood rather than magic what so yeah, yeah that's a good, good question, question actually. actually so, so with, with flesh, flesh i i've, I've collected, collected a little bit of magic, magic gathering for a few years now i've, I've never like really gone, gone into it, it. Um, um you know i don't pick up a box of every single set i pick and choose which sets look great i like the dragons in magic gathering i like that i'm really into that kind of fantasy so when I remember watching, my first exposure to Flesh and Blood was on Team Covenant on YouTube and Red Zone Rogue. I was watching Lord of the Rings box openings, actually, and it came up with Suggested, which is what's really important about YouTube with the Suggested is it, I often watch a lot of videos that will be suggested to me because I'm like, oh, okay. So it was purely that it just came up with Suggested that Team Covenant had done a Welcome to Wraith um draft play basically so they had done the drafts they'd opened up a box they were playing building decks and i remember i spent the whole evening just sitting there watching it and i was like this is something i need to get involved in and then i immediately went on line and bought a booster box um and then i remember yeah i opened it on my youtube actually i think it's 18th of december um so that's a good video that I recently, I mentioned to you recently, I've looked back on watching me open my first exposure personally to flesh and blood and kind of what I hope it will be and kind of what I think will happen. So, yeah, I, I watched Red Zone Road and Team Covenant on YouTube and I kind of, that, that I was watching that and I decided to open a box on YouTube, which was back in December 2020 and that was kind of, that was the start of the journey for me and I was collecting and I started to play a little bit as well. I was going to weekly armor events, which was great, but I haven't played for a while. So it's pretty much just collecting for me now. Yeah. You, so, you tried it out and it was, you, you yeah. did enjoy it, but you know, your main focus is the collecting side of things. Yeah. Which is, yeah if that's what you yeah, I don't. I used, I used to play UBO years, years ago. Um, I used to do events and that, and that was great, but I was younger and I had a lot of time. It's trying to do, collecting as well as you know working as well as making content yeah, it kind of doesn't leave very much room for that kind of thing which is not you know it's, it's part of it really maybe in the future it doesn't mean i won't ever play i'm going to try to go to some flesh and blood events like i do with the pokemon events um, because i know quite a few people now mostly in america now, but i know quite a lot of the uk community in discord which is great yeah it'd be nice um, it'd be nice to put usernames to faces and stuff when it's Exactly. exactly. This, like, like with, with, with Pokemon, Pokemon with these events, events. Yeah. Everyone, everyone in Flesh and Blood, Blood for the most part, has been absolutely amazing and they've, they've been really welcoming and helpful with any questions I have. I know that sometimes, sometimes I might like make content that, that they don't necessarily agree with, but they, they still, still show support. support. So yeah. Yeah. That's, that's it, really you know, promising you know, from a community. Yeah. It's like, you know, some other communities are quite divided with uh, that type of yeah. thing, like White Shores. Yeah, yeah, there's there's, there's been, been times. Yeah, um, we've, we've, we've discussed this before. There's been times where I felt that the player base and collector base was a little bit out of touch. But I think yeah. people are starting to accept now that the the, the actual, actual game, game itself is just growing and it's going to be a part of it. We, we can't just have players or just collectors. We need a good mix of both to keep the dynamic going and keep the card game alive. Um, why do you think it's growing so much at the moment? So, so I think, I think uh, Monarch was, was the fourth set, set that came out of Flesh and Blood, and that was a big turning point in Flesh and Blood. Blood. That, that was being hoarded by stores and distributors, yeah. and, and ended up prices, prices being £350, 350 pound a box on actual, actual release, release, which was ridiculous for any set. Like, like you wouldn't expect that of any card game. game. We, we see these crazy prices of Japanese Pokemon, but, you know, the demand is there for that. For Flesh and Blood, it wasn't. Um, a, lot a lot of product, of product was, was being kept, kept back, back and it was, was there was a lot of stuff that happened with flesh and blood and that's why we got fab 2.0 where, where we stopped, stopped getting first edition and unlimited and we just got one set for every single set, set that came out, out um which, which is, is absolutely safe flesh, flesh and blood in my opinion, opinion. It, it means, means the cold foil fables and legendaries are a lot harder to pull but it means that there's still that value in there for collectors to open but it means that a player can get anything so that that, that was, was a big, big turning point. point. And I, I think, think Flesh and Blood, Blood kind of went in on winter, winter as such, 12 to 18 months, months where 
Price was the one really rising. It was just a case of, you know, the player base was kind of growing and the collector base was growing, but sort of on the down low. And I think we've got, this year was a big turning point. I'm not sure why specifically. I think it was just, it was a new year. People had gained a bit of faith in Flesh and Blood again. So they realised that it wasn't just the TCG that was going to be here for a year or two like, like some, some of these Kickstarter, Kickstarter TCGs. TCGs. It, it was, was going to be a Kick, uh, TCG, TCG that, that was going to stay. So we're on four years now. 2019, we're on four years now. We're going up to our 10th set. set. Five, Five languages, languages so far going into six. I think it's safe to say that Flesh and Blood is is one of the card games that's going to hopefully last the next five to ten years. Oh, yeah, definitely. It does feel like the timing was kind of really like just awkwardly bad in in the sense that yeah. it came out when loads of kickstarter tcgs were just popping up so it, it it feels like really unfortunate that it kind of was bundled in with them at the start because yeah looking at it like it, it is it's it's just miles apart from the kickstarter tcgs like it, it doesn't even compare in my opinion like it just it, it, it just came out and already looked like an official trading card game but but it, it like it is it, it is an official trading card game um and it was just yeah it seemed like the timing was just awkwardly next to all the other kickstarters so yeah, yeah that was, it, it was, was it was a, a bad, bad time, time i think, I think. we yeah, had 2019, 2019 and we had the pandemic, pandemic and, and flesh, flesh and blood more, more so than most card games was, was made, made to be, be Played in the flesh, flesh and blood, that's, that's the whole point, point of it, that's, that's why the name is there. So, so when, when we, we couldn't, couldn't do that, that, the game launched and then suddenly we couldn't even play it because of the pandemic, it, it, it kind of stunted its growth a little bit, bit. and then and everyone, everyone, obviously the pandemic, pandemic here, all, all the investors, investors started, started getting, getting really into TCGs because we had a lot more, people had a lot more free time, and then it kind of just, people were buying like, what's the next big thing, and it was, you know, people buying Metazoo up, you know, prices for that was going ridiculous, Dragon Ball Z, then White started rising up as well as Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon. And then Flesh and Blood was kind of just like, had this big investor push and boxes for Alpha went above 10k. Um, I think some of the highest prices for Flesh and Blood items were 35 to 50k. And we won't see those prices again for a while. I think the closest to that is probably the gold foil um, uh, extended art spring tunic. That is probably around about those prices, but bar that, I think the closest is probably a case of alpha, which I think is 20 to 24k at the moment. It's, it's coming back then. It's, it's, it's coming back. It's yeah. Like health, healthily coming back in, in terms of prices. Yeah. yeah. It, it feels more organic now. It doesn't feel... Back, back then, it, it, it did feel a bit post you, know, you know, it was a bit forced, and I'll be honest, honest I think it wasn't it was a good time for flesh, flesh and blood back then. It, it did feel like a bit of a pump and dump. You, you know, know that, that, that sort of term is coined sometimes, sometimes, you know, Rudy, Rudy from Alpha Investments, Investments talks about it. And, and I know he's, he's been a big supporter of Flesh and Blood. He, throughout anybody says, says, he was buying when the market was low. He was buying multiple copies of these fables when people were telling them, you know, not to buy them. Yeah. And now, of course, they're times five, six price now since then. So, Yeah, I know obviously you've been picking it up. I feel like you've been picking it up from the beginning the whole way. I think that just shows how much you like the TCG. It wasn't just a, there's this new TCG and there's all this hype around it. It's like, no, 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 you genuinely really love collecting these cards. Yeah, yeah. It, I it came, I was, I started when Crucible of War first edition came out, so I picked a couple of those boxes up and they quickly went, I think I was I bought a couple of boxes for above retail. Um, they were around about two hundred pound each, and then they went up to over a thousand pounds. And that was that would be the moment I think for a lot of people, and they'd be like, "Well, if I was just in it to make money, I would sell them." And I didn't because I was like, I d I didn't buy them to sell. Like, I didn't buy any of the the stuff that I buy to sell. I bought it because I, you know, I really love yeah. it, and yeah. I I I believe in the philosophy of the card game. The, you know, the CEO and owner of it, the founder, James White, he is going to be, he goes to every event, all of these big call-ins and nationals, he attends all of them. At the Singapore uh, call-in, you can actually play against him. 
Oh, that's that's pretty Wait. cool. <laughs> Which and if you beat him, you win a cold foil, the hero that your deck is. So like you know, it's it, there's so much going for it yeah. that other TCGs haven't got into yet. Like PCG is the partner of Flesh and Blood, and that's a great company started by one of the pro players of Flesh and Blood, Matt Rogers. Oh. But that was started, and it's become a pretty much the main two grading companies now for Flesh and Blood, alongside Beckett. I know PSA are the largest grading company, but a lot yeah. of people don't use them for Flesh and Blood, which, you know, it's up to you what grading company you use, of course. But with the gold cold foils now that you win at events, they come pre-graded. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they basically what they do is they do nine plus and they'll make a load of copies and then only 40 of which or whatever the number, they tell you, it's actually on the website how much is made and distributed of each one. Oh, so you know cool. what's in circulation and they tell you what's in circulation currently, like what's been given to players and what still need to be given to players. That's that's really interesting. Like, that's yeah. just not what you, you know, you like you never know that that information at all. Exactly. No other card game is published in population reports. Like We have all the population reports for pretty much all the Flesh and Blood sets now in First Edition Unlimited. So we know how many boxes were made. And it also tells you how many boxes went to the US and how many boxes went to the rest of the world. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, they are, they're really serious about this. And I think that's because one of the, high, one of the big guys in LSS was one of was like an expert on the singles market for Yu-Gi-Oh. So they basically he I got together a team of people that were, you know, experts in TCGs yeah. for players and collectors because they wanted to kind of build best. So they bin all copies of these gold foils that don't reach a certain pre grade and they just tear them up and bin them. So from the new ones coming out now there shouldn't be any that are below the grade that they pre graded. Oh that's amazing. Yeah, that's yeah. So yeah, so different to any other TCG, like you said. Like, you just don't get that kind of information, and I, I guess yeah, from a with their insight into singles and things like that, they just know how important and how useful that information will be to other people. Yeah, yeah. No, no, and it's not something that maybe people are unaware of it, and you know that obviously it's very hard when you're inside this bubble of a TCG. You don't know what people know and don't know outside of it. And I think going to these card shows to me was really important because it opened my eyes to how small flesh and blood is compared to, I mean, it was the fourth, it's the fourth biggest selling TCG in Europe on card market. And it was the fastest growing TCG in 2022. But that means a lot. But also you think of the scale of Pokemon Magic the Gavin and Yu-Gi-Oh. It's worlds apart. Yeah. Um, so... It's gonna be. It's gonna take a while for Flesh and Blood to be in the same conversation as those three, I think. But you know, there's so many new card games coming out that you know it has to compete with. I mean, we've got. It moves on to the next thing, Lorcana, which was announced now that from I think the second set or the third or fourth wave of the first set, only brick and mortar stores are gonna be able to order the product. Yeah, that's very surprising. Like. I was really shocked to hear that. It just, it, I just, it, 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 I don't know what. I feel like when you do that, you just restrict who can purchase the cards massively, and it, it just seems like a strange move, because you know why don't you want those sales? Maybe they, you know, are struggling to to print as much as they want. I don't know. Like, I didn't didn't Flesh and Blood do a similar thing. A while ago. Yeah, so they're brick and mortar store only. So they originally started with stores, online stores. They always said they didn't want to be in big box stores like Walmart and Target yeah. and Amazon and such, but they did. Online stores were buying it because obviously, you know, with I think with the pandemic and such, but I know EPR Gaming, which is our main supplier pretty much for most card games, he was getting, he was one of the early adopters of Flesh and Blood yeah. because of, you know, that's how I got in. To involved with him because he was supplying me with flesh and blood and that and I was sort of giving him knowledge he was doing open ends and such but you know he can't even buy product now from distributor because of that and I think that for me hurt flesh and blood 
and that's what helped put that in a kind of a winter yeah. as such. And I think, I mean, Ravensburg make the Disney Lokana TCG. There, I mean, they make puzzles and stuff that's everywhere. It seems like a strange move for them, unless their vision is similar to Flesh and Blood, where they want to kind of focus on the player base. But from what we've seen already from the rulings that have been released now and how to play the game, it seems a bit of a mess. It doesn't seem that playable as a card game. So they've almost marketed it as a collector's card game, but are now going back on that. Yeah, it seems it seems it doesn't sort of make sense. E- e- either way, like you know, if you're focusing on only releasing in you know physical brick and mortar stores, and then it doesn't seem to to be uh, marketed as much for its playability. Like what you know, what why else would you be doing that? I mean, who knows? I guess once it's out, maybe we, you know we'll be able to gauge some of that information. Uh, are you going to pick any of it up, even though it's not available online? Do you think? Um, I think I probably will do. I I I wanted to get some of the D twenty three promos that came out, but yeah. they just went to really expensive prices, which yeah. of course they would be. So it's Disney. Yeah. But I will probably get a couple of boxes. I'd like to open some on the channel. They, the cards themselves look really nice. I like the art style that they've got. It's that kind of classic Disney. Yeah. I love the Disney Y set and the Pixar stuff. Um, but my favourite parts of that is the kind of classic art style, the hand drawn stuff. Yeah. So I'll be interested to pick some up. It'll be interested to see what it's like. Obviously, at the first release, online stores are going to be stocking it. So. We're going to have a big influx of product at the start. They have announced there isn't going to be a first edition. So that was something that a lot of people put off by, which I think is quite a smart move because it it did hinder flesh and blood a little bit, really, honestly. I think we've learned that. It, yeah. They tried it. It didn't really work. So I think other card games, learning from other card games is a really smart move. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with Lorcan, I think. Yeah, I think it's... As long as they get a healthy balance between playability and collecting, I think that's just the most yeah. important thing with most TCGs is you cater to both without restricting the other. Um, yeah. But it, it obviously, you know, if they've never made a TCG before, it's, you know, there's so many. It, it's going to be difficult to, to plan that out. But, yeah, I mean, it definitely looks interesting and it definitely will be interesting to watch. Like what it does in terms of prices and availability um but yeah look yeah it looks really good like you said the, the vintage style it's all it all has that same theme of style throughout the whole set so yeah it looks really nice to be honest yeah i'll definitely i'm sure we'll probably both pick up some of that and then probably open it and discuss it on the channel at some yeah, point yeah anyway. yeah it's yeah. it's got to be done i think new tcgs is always a good thing yeah if they're done right, you know, even even just picking up a box and trying it for yourself, I think we can we can make assumptions and kind of debate anyway. But until you open it up for yourself and have a feel, then you don't really know too much. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to that. And I guess the next thing we'll talk about is grading with PSA and BGS and CGC and stuff. Yeah, the so companies. We've been discussing. Um, the amount of cards being graded. So there's a page called Gemrate, I think, on Instagram, and they publish the data for the top five grading companies and how much they're grading daily, weekly, and monthly. And PSAs are grading hundreds, they're, they're grading millions of cards a month now. And every month they seem to grade more. We, You know, I've got two returns now from February that are already back now, and it's the start of April. So we're, we're looking at six to eight weeks right now for the lowest and that was the specials as well so what what are your thoughts on psa versus bgs at the moment it for me it always depends on the tcg and the card game that you're involved with so obviously why Schwarz, when people first started grading that it was just primarily bgs everything was in a bgs slab the quality is generally high throughout so again that was another reason people would you're grading with uh, BGS um, because yeah you're quite like likely to hit those high grades anyway 
Um, and I feel like BGS is normally used for a lot of like alternative TCGs and, and you know the less popular TCGs. But I think now with Wise Falls, it's pro probably like a 50 50 split. Uh, there's a lot more PSA Wise Falls cards than there you know was two, one two years ago. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, flesh and blood in, in the cards you collect, you've, you've got different options as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's, uh, again, it's a, it's a really good point there. It kind of depends what card game you're grading. Um, BGS were known for a while as grading a lot of the card games that PSA didn't. But I think PSA now are pretty much grading nearly everything. So that kind of, that gap between BGS and PSA is is they pretty much grade almost the same stuff now but i think psa with obviously nat turner taking over they scaled up you know they've grown they they opened up other locations they've they've expanded as what a company should do when it gets more popular and it it kind of feels that beckett have just been kind of left in the dust a little bit they don't seem to be looking to want to improve at all yeah, in terms of those numbers that you were talking about earlier with how much gets graded, uh, yeah, it's really weird to see Beckett's numbers kind of just fall. And I don't know, it's not like PSA. Um, yeah, I think it's quite obvious they haven't been scaling in the same way PSA has. Yeah, it's it's quite obvious. Uh... <laughs> oh, your cat's come on. That's all right, I'm sure people will enjoy that. Right, you People love cat. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's an interesting thing as well, and it also has C CGC and SGC, which SGC do a lot of Star Wars and a lot of sports cards. Yeah. So it's interesting to see the comparable between them. I mean, Beckett now are grading like you know less than ten thousand a day. I think two thousand to five thousand is average a day they're grading. Yeah. Whereas PSA are, I think they're grading like you know, tens of thousands a day. Yeah. Um, so Beckett, I've slipped down. I think PCG is the other competitor to BGS with Flesh and Blood, I know. And I've got some returns coming back where I graded some uh, Flesh and Blood with PSA because I, I wanted to see what it was like yeah. in person. Um, I know there's some big collectors on Instagram and within the community. They've got absolute grails of the, of the, the Flesh and Blood and they use PSA because they moved from using Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, PSA and stuff. So it is a, it's a good conversation, I think. I really hope that Beckett improve more and start to scale, because I like the product they deliver. I mean, yeah. I think for Rice Labs, they look a lot better, same as Flesh and Blood. But if they don't scale up with the next... I, I predicted in the next 12 to 18 months, if they don't start scaling up or making any changes... I can see them dropping out from yeah. the, the top two grading companies, honestly. Obviously, they attempted to make a change recently, didn't they? Um, that, yeah. They kind of had to backtrack that one. <laughs> yeah, they were trying to change their grading scales. I think they they were quite smart with where they timed it because it was the day before April Fool's. And it was, an, it was actually an event they had and some of the employees, I don't know if the data they were given or the information they were given was wrong, but we obviously saw these images put, sort of perk up everywhere and people were debating what was going on and that. And then they sort of backtracked and said, look, you know, we want some feedback from the community and that. And I think, you know, for the odd chance that anybody from Beckett here is watching this video, I would say the grain scale isn't the issue here. You know, people have always gone for that black label. That is what your that is what now your product has that other companies don't. But you need to scale up and kind of. I'm not saying like you need to be grading as many as PSA because PSA have a, a big cash flow injection, and that's probably why they could expand. But you have to ask with all the profits that Beckett have been making these last few years and that. What, where's the money going? What's it being used for? Yeah, re reinvest into... I mean, I don't know if you remember what their population reports and trying to find cards on there has been like, but it's, oh God. It's, it's like it was made 10 years ago. It's Yeah, that needs to be improved. PSA really do... Again, with PSA improving, they've got 
um, you know, the apps, they've got the registry app and now you can have your collections and that. You can, they've got PSA Vault as well. So, you know, they've got so many different products that can showcase your collection as well, which is what people want. And also, you know, track prices. They, they import eBay sales as well. So it has the whole thing, whereas Beckett's, it is literally trying to break into a police hole, yeah. trying to get the population reports to Beckett. It's, it needs... I don't know if I know the website has been down a couple of times recently, and so some of the data for the the amount of cars they're grading has actually sort of not been revealed. But I don't know if that's part of them kind of going right. This is something we need to look at because yes. it's been something people have talked about for years now. Yeah, it could. It could. You're right. It could be them, you know, starting to try and make improvements, and that's why things are down. But uh, yeah, I guess we won't know until. Yeah, more time passes and if if we get sort of you know updated website that that just is a lot a lot easier obviously even with psa you get scans of your cards there's just there's so much there and i know you know they don't get the same volume so you know the revenue is probably not the same um but yeah you just yeah you need to push those things those things are extremely important to the collectors that are sending their cards in like if you can't look up the pot easily, like that, that's just it. It, it kind of yeah, it's always blown my mind how it's been, how their website has been. Um, yeah, it's the PSA have kind of understood. They understood the assignment. Yeah, really, honestly, that yeah. you know they really have, and they all props to PSA. There's been a lot of you know a lot of stuff that's happened in the last couple of years. A lot of drama with things like Ludkins and stuff and Great Gem and absolutely all respect to PSA, honestly, because a lot of people still in the comments will be probably saying a lot of bad things to them. And, I, you know, they're not they're not perfect. No company is. There is inconsistency sometimes. We've all had some cards great that could have been damaged possibly or, you know, things have happened. But for the most part, you look at where they are now compared to three years ago. It's, a, it's almost an entirely new product, really. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's really, really different. And maybe maybe in the future episodes we can touch on some of those sort of UK issues that we had with yeah. grading with PSA. And, uh, to be honest, we we still have to some degree because, you know, we we have to resort to using middlemen and things like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think we've been talking for quite a while now that's probably a, a good point yeah. to, to wrap it up so um we're both going to place this on our own channels at the moment so if you're watching this online yeah. you can uh go see pokey tinking's channel i'll put it in the description and likewise he'll do the same for me exactly. so um yeah we've got a lot of future episodes planned we've got guests planned um so yeah yeah Ho hope you guys liked it and enjoyed the content and there'll be many more episodes for you to watch and listen to have a great day. See ya.